What would you do for your freedom? What risk would you take? How far would you go to make yourself free? Powerful questions, my friends, but difficult ones. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. What would you do for your freedom? A difficult question, for today in America, we cannot imagine not enjoying the many freedoms that we have. And yet for that African in America, that African in slavery, freedom was the foremost thought upon his mind, as it would be for any man or woman. How to become free. And despite punitive laws and barbaric cruelty, the system of slavery, which was supported by the major institutions of our country, African men and women struggled to be free, struggled for their freedom. And their struggle is a story of courage, ingenuity, and tenacity. And once the decision was made to move on, to leave slavery behind, to run away, run away to freedom, that road got a lot harder. That Underground Railroad was such a road to freedom. Here in southeastern New England and Boston, it was a very active road. So join me as we team up with our sister parks, the Boston African American National Historical Site and New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park as we find that Underground Railroad to freedom. We follow that road to learn what people would do to make themselves free. that relationship between the desire for freedom and the Underground Railroad, we're going to talk with Peggy Overly and Jerry Gore from the National Underground Railroad Museum in Maysville, Kentucky. There's courage, there's strength, you know, and it's just the kind of thing that gives you the willpower that uh, helps you to go on and do what you have to do, regardless of what obstacles are thrown out there in your way. So when we think about the history of the Underground Railroad, we're talking about the history of a free people, African people coming from Africa as doctors and lawyers, kings and queens, and going through almost 300 years of enslavement in this nation. And that story is one that needs to be told. It was a story about individuals yearning to be free, and more importantly, for their children to be free. Can you tell us a little bit about how music played such an important role? Music played a very important role because the ancestors had to have some kind of relief. So what they did, they did it through song. Even when they were being abused and beaten by the slave master, they knew that they could always talk to the Almighty Creator. So what they would do is they would do it through song. Motherless Child is a very special song because um, the slaves, I mean, here they were in a place they had no control over. So they were like motherless children. The spiritual, like motherless child, when I think of my, of my ancestors, this is the way they sang it. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home a long way from home You know music has always been the universal language and music always gives the hope and the inspiration and been the universal language whether it was the escaping African slave, or whether it was the Native American underground conductor, or the European underground conductor, all of them understood that music. They understood the hidden messages that were in these songs. And these songs served as telegraph words to say, come on, Chellen, we're getting up out of here. We're going to freedom. Those songs also served as hope and inspiration for those enslaved Africans to know that a better day was coming. 
The majority of escaping slaves made their way to freedom totally unassisted. There was no organized system of how they got away. They were just running, running for their freedom. A lot of the paintings that you see and some of the visual uh, depictions of slavery, it has, you know, a slave family cowering, afraid. When you think about the Underground Railroad, a different image comes. Now, can you speak a little bit about that, the image of, of of that runaway slave is, is, is not a, one of a victim, is it? Yeah, Chuck, I'm glad it's not one of a victim. I'm so glad that you asked that question because all of us, for the most part, came up in this nation believing that the slave was dumb and ignorant, that he was a slave. And that's the reason I use the term enslaved, because these people were free African people and the culture had been passed on. The slave master tried to take away the culture of the people. But those African people knew that as long as they could hold on to that culture, the folkways, the music, the religion, the food, the language. And so really they were heroes and sheroes on the highest orders. And so right now in 1998, as we get ready to go into the new millennium, to me I think it's very important for people to know, especially our young people, especially young African American children, to know that those African slaves were some of the most brilliant and brave people in this country. No, they went and got their freedom. The story of slavery and the story of the Underground Railroad movement is not just an African-American story, it's an American story. It's a major part of the untold story of this country and that makes this country the greatest country that it is. That you had men and women, black, white, Native American, Hispanic American, Mexican American, <laughs> who were willing to lay their very lives on the line, either to be free or to help another brother or sister to freedom. And I think this is the message that we need to spread around this country today more than any time in the history of our nation. To me, this is a time for healing. And if we understand it as a time of healing, yes, slavery was a terrible, terrible thing, but it's something that happened and it's part of history. So we have to put everything in, in its proper a perspective and understand it's time to heal now and it's time to understand it and then it's okay if, if it makes you feel pain we understand that. The fact that those of us whose ancestors were enslaved the same DNA that was in their blood is the same DNA that runs in our blood so I, I say to my brothers and sisters of African descent every time you think about slavery and the pain hits you're really just experiencing a part of that ancient African memory system, but what you have to keep focused on is that only the strongest survived. And those of us today who are alive in America, we are a part of that legacy. So that same strength lies in us. The year was 1770, and just over a half million men, women, and children of African origin or descent toiled in the fields, the farms, and the shops of British North America as slaves. Economics made slavery profitable. And in that same year, 1770, the Quakers here in Uxbridge, Massachusetts built this Quaker meeting house. The Quakers were a strong moral force at that time. And many individual Quakers made significant contributions to the workings of the Underground Railroad. But the Quaker religion was like many religions. What their beliefs were did not always transcend into the actions of their daily lives. For in fact, Quakers too owned slaves. Quakers also made fortunes based on their connections to the southern cotton plantations. And so it was very appropriate that we come here today to talk about the challenges and the dilemmas of attempting to identify and document the many sites of the Underground Railroad in southeastern New England. Now, I have some good friends from National Park Service inside who are going to talk about just how great a challenge we face. The National Historic Landmarks Program is uh, the uh, highest recognition of uh, historic properties uh, available through federal programs. And the wonderful thing about the program is that uh, it is organized according to themes and uh, so that the best way to recognize properties significant in the nation's history uh, is to understand the historic context and the particular theme that they're associated with. 
as you said, the Underground Railroad is a, uh, the story of the Underground Railroad is a, is one that is untold and uh, needs to be much better understood uh, in many ways. Um, and the National Historic Landmarks Program can accomplish that. This particular project is uh, organized in a whole series of study areas that involve uh, several places around the country, one of which is Boston and Southern New England. And here is our opportunity to, to understand how the Underground Railroad worked uh, in this area, who participated in it, um, and very importantly, perhaps just as importantly, where those uh, Underground Railroad activities took place and how we can protect them and preserve them in telling the story of the Underground Railroad. Why is it important that we capture, we grab hold of those stories and help preserve these sites? Well, nationally, it's important to preserve the stories because, as you and Dick mentioned, this is an important topic in American history that, on one hand, many people know about. Many people know about these stories in their local communities. They've been preserving these stories for years. But nationally, the story is not out. In our educational institutions, the story is not well known. I do a lot of work with teachers where they want the information, they want to bring it to their students, and they just don't have it. We have the opportunity here to help people do the research, to get the documentation and preserve the sites and bring it to a broader public. We need to understand the conditions that people were living in when they were enslaved, both in the North and in the South. What, what would bring them to the point where they would risk their lives to escape to another part of the country, not knowing where they were going, not knowing whether they would make it or not. We need to understand that as a nation. For me, I guess the most important um, thing to do is to bring the stories out to explain the differences of the Underground Railroad and especially explain its relationship to slavery and why the Underground Railroad came to be. Continuing with what uh, Tara just mentioned, I think that one of the really important things that uh, we have to look at is um, American slavery has been really kind of overlooked in a lot of aspects. And so it's important because I think people still need to heal. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding that needs to be uh, taken care of. And I guess the ultimate goal here would be to move on, to, to be able to uh, deal with this history of the Underground Railroad and slavery in such a way that helps people uh, understand themselves and, and hopefully uh, move to a higher place uh, where that we can actually come together and, and get past some of these very uh, disheartening feelings. Most uh, people uh, do have an interest in this, and it's individual citizens who have collected stories, uh, maybe their family stories or um, things that have been uh, with their families for numbers of years. So there's a certain amount of pride that already exists uh, surrounding this particular topic. So um, as the parks, from the Park Service point of view, what we want to do is provide the opportunities to help them tell those stories. We have to create a presence so people uh, know if they need help with some of these things, they can you know, turn to people and, and they're, they're going to be there willing to help them out. We don't have all the answers in this case, do we? No, we don't. I mean, and I think that's uh, one of the things that's really kind of exciting about this is because this is uncharted territory. A lot of people, uh, there's so many misconceptions about the Underground Railroad. I think the more we bring people in and they share with us their family stories and, and things that you might not read in a book or you might not know about, uh, the better this will be. The Underground Railroad had a, a unique quality in New England uh, and I believe it is intimately tied with the way the African American communities developed uh, in uh, Eastern and Southern New England especially. The North was not necessarily a place where African Americans could uh, join a community and feel welcome. There were many, many problems uh, derived from uh, their, their experiences directly here. So these various experiences and the coupling of the Underground Railroad with, a very, with an overt, energetic effort to define liberty, to uh, seek the abolition of slavery, and at the same time develop African American communities that were uh, uh, sound, uh, um, strong, uh, vibrant parts of the places that they live were, were critical components of the Underground Railroad in, in New England. The story of the Underground Railroad is a story of connection. To uncover some of those connections, we're going to journey up to Boston, New Bedford, and Central Falls in Rhode Island.
Hi, my name is Frank Middleton. I'm a ranger here at Boston African American National Historic Site, and I'd like to welcome you to the African Meeting House. This is a very special building. This is the oldest black church built by free black people still standing in the United States. This structure served as the center of the free black community here in Boston, Massachusetts. Of the many events that took place here in this building, um, one of the more important ones was the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law and how that affected this free black community. This was a free black community of about 1,000 African Americans, men, women, and children. And of those 3,000, there are roughly 800 fugitive slaves. So the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law had incredible ramifications for this community. Here in Boston, there was one case more than any other that really kind of solid or solidified uh, what the Boston free black community was all about. And that was the case of Shadrach Minkins. Minkins was an escaped slave from Norfolk, Virginia. And he had made his way uh, by ship here to Boston, Massachusetts in 1849. Upon his arrival, he found work down at the Cornhill Coffee House. There's a lot of debate going on here in the city over this issue of slavery. And in particular, the following year when they passed the Fugitive Slave Law. Now what this law does is that it gives southern slave owners the right to retrieve their runaway slaves. And Boston had long been a haven for fugitive slaves as shown by the numbers that were here. Minkins is noticed or recognized by his owners. And there are slave catchers that are sent. His owners, John De Beers, uh, sends slave catchers here to reclaim Mr. Minkins. Now this causes quite a stir within the black community. This uh, escape was led by one of Boston's more prominent leaders, an escaped slave himself, a gentleman named Lewis Hayden. Now Hayden realized that this was a very serious issue and he realized that if the black community did not take a stand that they were in jeopardy of losing everything. Imagine if you could uh, the fact that you've been here for 10 or 15 years and now everything that you've worked for is in jeopardy. And that was the situation. This was serious business. There were a number of people who, rather than risk being caught, they fled to Canada because the risk was that great. Well, here in Boston, the black community decided that they were going to make a stand, that they were not going to run in the face of this law. They thought this was an oppressive law. They thought this was an unfair law. And they were going to stand their ground. And Hayden, more than any other person, symbolized that passion, that ability to say no. And it was almost like drawing a line in the sand. We are not going to allow you to come here and take our people away. Hayden or organizes a mob of 20 members. They rush the courthouse doors. And when you read newspaper accounts of this day, um, the atmosphere is, is chaotic. There's incredible energy in the air. Um, these men storm. They push open the courthouse doors while the marshals are in there. These men grasp Mr. Minkins, and in the accounts, you know, he's almost terrified. He doesn't know if these people are there to help him or to hurt him. And so it's a very chaotic scene in the courthouse. But these men successfully drag this man, this man, Shadrach Minkins, out of this courthouse and get him off to safety. No single event epitomized the will and the determination of the free black community here in Boston like the rescue of Shadrach Minkins. This was uh, an event that involved a number of prominent black folks here in the community. And it really made a stand. It really made a statement, not only to the, to the United States government, but to the world. It said that we are going to be active participants in our own destiny, in our own future. We are not simply going to be the pawns of the United States government. And it was Hayden uh, who made this very clear when he said that they who would be free must first strike the blow. It matters little what may be a man's nationality, his color, his language, or religion. The only questions to be asked are, has he the arm to pull an oar, the eye to aim a harpoon, the heart to face a wounded whale in his stormy wrath? Recruitment ad in a New Bedford newspaper. Hi, I'm Frank Barrows from the New Bedford Whaling National Historical Park. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Underground Railroad in New Bedford. In order to tell this story correctly, I can't just tell my story. We have to tell stories from all over southern, southeastern Massachusetts and the country in order to fully portray the Underground Railroad. The thing that brought fugitives to this area was the whaling industry. The whaling industry was so prosperous at this time 
that we had the number one port in the whole world. This provided unusual opportunities for black men to seek employment on these whaling vessels. This combined with a strong Quaker community and equalitarian beliefs provided an unusually tolerant atmosphere for fugitive slaves. Our most famous fugitive, Frederick Douglass, who arrived here from New York and actually arrived in Newport, which is 25 miles from here, was met by two Quaker gentlemen from New Bedford. These two Quakers were in a stagecoach. The words New Bedford were written big in yellow print. And when Frederick Douglass got off that boat, one of these gentlemen grabbed him by the arm, said, Thee, get in. Frederick Douglass never obeyed a command like he obeyed that one. When he first arrived here, he stayed at a house on 7th Street. His house was owned by Nathan Johnson. Him and his wife were fed, clothed, and given shelter by these people that were complete strangers. Frederick Douglass is just one of many fugitives that we can link to these other National Historic Parks. We cannot fully tell the story of the Underground Railroad by using one site. New Bedford cannot tell the story of the Underground Railroad. We must come together, form these connections, then we can tell the story. One of the most fascinating characters in the history of the Blackstone Valley is Elizabeth Buffum Chase, who became renowned throughout Rhode Island and all of America for her role as a reformer, working for the prison reform movement, the women's suffrage, and also for the anti-slavery movement. She had a strict Quaker upbringing, which played a good role in her later reform efforts. She was able to convince her husband Samuel to follow along in her abolitionist leanings, and she became very active in the anti-slavery movement, and in fact was a founder of the Ladies' Anti-Slavery Society of Fall River in 1835. Mrs. Chase returned to Rhode Island to take up the new role as Mill Village matriarch, but also to continue in her abolitionist ways. Mrs. Chase decided to take a much more active role and to use her home as a stop on the Underground Railroad. According to her journal, slaves trying to escape the South would often try to get on board a ship heading north to New England, whether by stowing away, bribery, or by trying to get permission from a friendly captain. Those who could make it to either Cape Cod or New Bedford were often taken to Fall River, where they would stay with her sister Sarah and her husband, Nathaniel Borden, at their house in Fall River. They would then be taken by wagon from Fall River to Valley Falls, where they would be put up for the night, or for several nights, at the Chase homestead. After the runaways had been allowed to rest for a while, Samuel Chase would take them over to the Providence and Worcester Railroad and enlist the aid of a conductor to take them on north to Worcester. Once they were in Worcester, they would make a connection with a Unitarian minister who would try to get them up through the Vermont Railroad and up towards Canada. Mrs. Chase always gave them a self-addressed envelope so that when they reached Toronto, they could send it back and she would get the postmark there to know that they had finally escaped from beyond the baleful influence of the Stars and Stripes. In her writings, Mrs. Chase relates some of the difficulties that she and her family faced when they were trying to harbor these fugitives because it was quite a dangerous occupation for them to undertake. She recounts of one slave, he was sitting by our fireside in Valley Falls while with bolted doors and barred windows we were hastily fitting the two fugitives out with warmer clothing for their wintry journey northward. Had the slave catchers come for those young men, we should not have opened our doors to them. We have all these events recorded in Elizabeth Buffum Chase's journals, but unfortunately, neither of the homes that she used as a stop in the Underground Railroad, either in Cumberland or in Central Falls, remains. In fact, her 1857 home here in Central Falls has been replaced by this massive industrial structure. And that's unfortunate because we're not only missing a piece of our local history, but it's an important connection for the Underground Railroad, which is gone. Here in the National Park Service, we're working to collect documentary evidence to try to prove as many possible sites along the Underground Railroad that were being used as way stations. And it's important not only because it helps us discover more about our history here in the Blackstone Valley and all of New England, but it's a way that we can take the story of the Underground Railroad and try to raise it above the level of just legend or, or local lore and turn it into a piece of serious scholarship that we can study and that we can teach 
as an important part of our heritage here in New England and throughout the United States. This is National Park Service Ranger Kevin Clyver from the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. The Underground Railroad is a story of an unquenchable thirst for freedom. It's truly an American story, filled with its villains and its heroines. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and all for freedom. And yet, it's a story that still haunts us. Bits of oral tradition, local legend, mixed with facts, give us a sense of the Underground Railroad, but the true story still eludes us. There's so many parts of it that remain hidden and untold. And as one of my National Park Service Rangers said, we can't tell the story by ourselves. We need your help. So call us. Tell us of your family and your community's connection to the Underground Railroad. And through that kind of history, we'll be able to answer the question of what people did for their freedom. <laughs>